Okay, this unit, unit five, pretty simple unit. You guys are actually going to have a bit of a relief. It's very straightforward, lots of math, and is going to intersect really well with a topic in physics. I believe you do thermo and physics second semester, but this is, this is going to be pretty straightforward, um, pretty, pretty easy. So a little bit of theory before we start. Um, we know thermodynamics is the study of heat, energy, and work, and how they're all interrelated. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at this delta E. This is internal energy. You'll learn more specifically about internal energy and what it really means in physics. For now, we're going to focus on, yeah, we will have to calculate internal energy at times, but we're primarily focusing on Q and W, heat and work. Um, what's really important in this unit and where students um, seem to make the most mistakes is they forget about their signs and they don't, don't look at them as being super, super important. The sign convention is crucial. Signs tell you direction or tell you whether work is on or off a system, whether the system's working or whether the work is being done on the system. All of that is told by the signs, as well as direction of flow of heat when we're looking at endo and exothermic. So signs are just as crucial as numbers. So let's not take the signs for granted. Um, we're also going to be looking at things that chemical reactions participate in and we have two terms. One is called system and one is called surroundings. The system is the reaction. That's what we're looking, we're looking at the perspective, from the perspective of the system whenever we do anything in this class. Surroundings is everything else. So when we talk about exothermic, we're talking about heat being released from the system, by the system. We don't say it's exothermic because heat is absorbed by the surroundings, no. We look at it with respect to the system. When you get to physics, you're going to have to sometimes look at it from both perspectives. But just know we only look at things from the perspective of the system. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with our Chem 1. The next like few pages of your notes, all Chem 1. Um, exothermic, the process of heat flowing from the system to the surroundings. It's exiting. Heat is exiting. Exo starts with an EX. Exit starts with an EX. Endothermic heat flowing from the surroundings into the system, and it's entering. This begins with an EN. Endo begins with an EN. Different ways you can remember it. Here's just a little diagram. You all know this, right? Pretty simple. Okay. Now this then brings us to these energy diagrams. Remember the little humpy diagrams that you had, where you had a hump like this, and then you might have had a hump like this. Okay. We're actually measuring here our change in energy, or we looked at it with the term enthalpy. Okay. Or if we wanted that change in energy, we always did energy final minus energy initial. And we're looking at this in terms of heat. We're looking at energy in the form of heat. So final minus initial will give us our delta H or our Q. So this right here is your delta H, and this right here is your delta H. Okay. So you can look at this and just looking at the diagram without being given much other information, you can tell me if it's endo or exothermic. Here we have high reactants, high energy or high heat reactants, low energy, low heat products. If we're doing final minus initial, it's products minus reactants, final minus initial. What can you tell me about the magnitude of that number? A little number minus a big number. Negative, good, and that would be what we know as exothermic. Here we have a high product state minus low, big number minus small number. What happened to the heat? Where did it? How did we get from low to high? Heat entered. A big number minus a small number is a positive number, right? And I should go back to the first one and state it kind of that way. What happened to the heat? Here we had a lot of heat not as much heat. Where did it go? Bye-bye. It exited. Okay. So this is our endothermic right here. And then our exothermic is on the left. Okay. Any questions on that? What was it that we could do? What was the energy from here up here called? From the reactant to up there? What was that called? Does anybody remember? Yes. Activation energy. So if we were to change that, would our delta H change? at all? 
No, our delta H would not change at all. I need you to realize that activation energy is independent of heat of reaction. If we change the activation energy, we might speed the reaction up, but we're not going to change the delta H of the reaction. How do we change the activation energy? Y'all remember? What do we add? Yep, add a catalyst. But that's another unit. I'm just bringing that up for now. Okay? All right, next slide. What's new to you guys is work. Um, a lot of words here. You can read that. Um, I don't need to necessarily read it to you. But the only way a chemical system can produce, can do work, the chemicals, the, the, the work that we use in this class, is by the production of, of gas. So work in a chemical system is equal to gas production. That's it. That's the only way we can do work. Why is that? Well, when a gas is produced, you got to think of it as pushing against the atmosphere. And that's the work we're talking about. Okay? And if you look at the... Um, we can kind of go through this. Consider a system composed of gas in a flexible container. If the gas expands, it's pushing out on the atmosphere and doing work. The energy in the final state will be less. Therefore, the sign of the work, we'll talk about why. I've got a little way to remember this. Work would be negative. If the gas is being compressed by the atmosphere, work is being done on the system, and that's going to be positive. How to remember that? Let me see what's on this next slide. I have room. Okay. I'm just going to kind of write it down here. This is my little demo trick. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at a system. Let's say you're the system. Who can I pick on today? Julian's the system. Okay. Julian is the chemical reaction. And Julian's doing work. So how is Julian doing work? What is he producing? Gas. So we've got Julian doing work by producing a gas. Does, does Julian like to do work? Does anything like to do work? Anybody like to do work? No. So that's a negative thing. Okay? If the system does work, that's negative. It's a negative thing. System doing work. Who wants to do work? No one. System doing work is negative. Now, let's say Julian doesn't like his nose. He's getting a lot of pressure. He's being compressed. He's getting a lot of pressure to fix his nose. So he has work done on him. Julian gets work done on him, so work is done on the system. He gets a little plastic surgery. Work is done on the system. If work's done on the system, hey, nice nose positive thing. I'm not condoning plastic surgery. So, if the system does work, uh, negative. system doesn't want to do work. If work is done on the system, that's positive. Okay? How we calculate it, this is going to be something that is huge in physics. How many of you are concurrently enrolled in some kind of physics class right now? Probably 98% of you, 99% of you. So, I'm not hurting you by forcing you to learn this. This equation is not on the AP equation sheet. By the way, the other equation we did, the delta E is Q plus W, not on the AP equation sheet either. Not on AP sheet. Um, it's going to be super, super common in physics. Might as well learn it now. And work is equal to negative P delta V. Let's look at the units and see how they work. Work is a measure. We measure it in energy. So what's the unit we want on that? Joules. Good. Pressure, we want an ATM. And this is going to be a change in volume measured in liters. How the heck does atmosphere liter lead to joules? Here's the conversion. 101.3 joules is equivalent to one liter atmosphere. So whenever you multiply your pressure by your volume, and I'm asking for work value, you have to convert it to joules. Because liter atmosphere is nothing I can then later use in maybe an energy equation or in a Q equals MC delta T equation. I have to be in joules. And it's a super, these problems, you guys, are gonna, you're going to be so stunned how easy they are. Let me go back real quick and just mark on these notes that your Q delta E, this is not on the AP equation sheet, so I need you guys to study this one as well.
All right. So let's do some problems. And you'll see these are super simple as long as you watch your units. It's easy. Calculate delta E, internal energy, for a system undergoing an endothermic process in which 15.6 kilojoules of heat flow and 1.4 kilojerk, kilojerk, <laughs> kilojoules of work. You see where I got jerk out of that? Work and joules. Kilojoules of work is done on the system. So what's the equation I use? Delta E is equal to what? Good. Q plus W. Great. So now I'm going to do a little plug and chug, but i got to watch my signs. Delta E. And make sure that both of these are in the same unit if you're going to add them. It says endothermic process. So what does that tell me about Q? Q is positive 15.6. Okay. Plus 1.4. And I'm sorry, this is kilojoules. So i got to watch my units. 1.4 kilojoules of work is done on the system. Getting plastic surgery, good or bad? Positive, 1.4 kilojoules. Okay, let's add them up and tell me what you get. So when you add to sig figs, one decimal place, 17.0 kilojoules is equal to the internal energy. Okay? All right. Calculate the work associated with the expansion of gas. Okay, gas is expanding. So is the system doing work? Yes. So what can we predict the W to be? Good. We hope we're going to get a negative W. All right. At a constant external pressure of 15 atm. So work is negative P delta V. All right. I'm calculating the work. I'm at a constant pressure of 15 atm. I always do deltas as final minus initial. So, final minus initial, my final volume is 64. My initial is 46. And these are eight, these are liters. Whoops. Now watch my units here. What's my unit after I do this multiplication? That's no, not joules. When I do the multiplication, what's my unit? Liter atmosphere. Good. So what is my number in liter atmospheres? Negative 270. What? It's just negative 270. That's it? Okay. And um, I'll worry about sig figs at the end. But that's a liter atmosphere. Now... That doesn't mean anything to me. I never want you to report an answer in liter atmospheres. So let's go ahead and convert. My conversion is for every one latum, I have 101.3 joules. All right, we get negative 2.7 times 10 to the fourth joules. That's kind of gross. Can we make it kilojoules? Not that we have to. So isn't that negative 27 kilojoules? And you know what? If you give it to me in joules, I'm fine. There was nothing in this problem that said report in kilojoules. But on the AP exam, the majority of the time, they will ask you to report in a certain unit. So was, as you're reading your AP questions, be underlining what your final answer needs to be in or circling or something. Um, so either one of these answers is acceptable. Okay, next question. A balloon is being inflated to its full extent by heating the air inside it. What can you tell me about work then? Negative. Work's negative because it's compressing against the surroundings. Um, so we're predicting a negative work. In the final stages of this process, the volume of the balloon changes from 4E6 to 4.5E6 by the addition of 1.3E8 joules of energy. By the addition of, what is that Q? Positive or negative? Positive is endothermic. Assuming that the balloon expands against a constant pressure of 1 atm, calculate delta E. So we need to find delta E. We have Q, because I see it right there. Q is there. What about W? Do I have W? Nope, i got to calculate it using W is equal to negative P delta V. So, W is equal to, my pressure is a constant 1 atm, 
my final volume is 4.5 E6. My initial volume is 4 E6. And let's solve. So our work turns out to be, we're not going to worry about sig figs until the end, 5 times 10 to the 5th. And what's the unit on this? Liter atmospheres? Is it negative? It should be negative, yes. Um, so we're going to convert the liter atmospheres because if we're going to need to add it to Q, we have to be in the same unit. And up there, Q is in joules. So let's go ahead. For every 101.3 1, joules, I have one latum. Right. 5.0. 0.07 times 10 to the 7th joules. Okay, now what do I do? And again, it's negative. I keep dropping that negative. Gosh darn. All right, so now we're going to add those to the heat up here. So our internal energy is equal to the Q, which we determined was positive 1.3 times 10 to the 8th joules, plus our work of negative 5.07 times 10 to the 7th joules. Okay, and your final answer of your internal energy is equal to 7.9 times 10 to the 7th, and my unit, joules. Good. Okay. And that is all you need to know for work and internal energy. That's it. That's as hard as they get, so they're not too bad. What I want to go through now is the concept of specific heat. And you learned this last year quite a bit. You talked about specific heat being the amount of heat required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Can anyone tell me what the most, the highest specific heat, I can't even speak, what substance has the highest specific heat? Water does. Okay, that's responsible for so many properties of, well, hydrogen bonding is responsible for that, but that is what is the basis of basically life. We'd have no lakes, we'd all be dead in Texas in the summer because our bodies would all evaporate away. Um, so very, very important concept. Um, things with a high specific heat absorb more heat, things with a low absorb less. So have you all ever cooked a turkey or a meatloaf or something like that? Have you ever noticed when you take the oven, the pan out of the oven, that you can more r rapidly touch the aluminum foil than you can the pan. That's not because the aluminum's thinner or anything. That's because aluminum has a lower specific heat. So it has a very low specific heat. So it loses the heat quicker. And it, gain, and it, and it gets hotter faster, but it also loses the heat more quickly. Okay. Um, what we're going to tie this to is the use of Q equals MCAT. And so we're going to do some basic Chem 1 level heat calculations. And tomorrow we're going to um, transition into calorimetry, both coffee cup and bomb calorimetry. Um, heat capacity, what's this? Um, one thing last year, and I heard that from last period that some of the classes didn't do this, but you should have done, if not in person, online, some sort of coffee cup calorimetry problem, a lab, where you measure the delta T of a substance and you end up putting in the mass of the two liquids added up and... In regular chem, I know they actually physically did this. But anyway, you made an assumption when you did that lab that the coffee cup, because it was styrofoam, you assumed that no heat was lost. So you never had to deal with heat capacity. All heat capacity is, is how much heat an object, like a calorimeter or a thermometer or something, is going to absorb. Um, we will visit this tomorrow. And you can just make a note that this is for calorimetry only. And again, I'll talk about it tomorrow when we're actually doing the problems. And you are going to do a calorimetry lab this year, for sure. Um, and I'll introduce that. That's going to be the lab we're going to do. I, hopefully I have it on this calendar before the test. That's really important. So let's just jump in to do some of these problems super easy. We're going to use the equation Q equals MCAT to find the heat of a reaction. Let's check out units, though, before we start doing too much. We know Q is in joules. Mass we want in grams. Specific heat, 
is how many joules is required to raise a gram, to raise one gram degree Celsius. So it's joules over gram degree Celsius. And then what do you think our temperature needs to be in? Degrees Celsius. Okay. So do you see how the grams cancel? And then the degrees Celsius cancel, leaving us with joules. Okay. Here's a question, though, that I have for you. What if I were given temperatures in Kelvin? Subtract them. Oh, you, I'm saying to convert to Celsius. What if I told you you didn't have to? What would you say to that? I was full of poop. You know, well, we're subtracting. It's the difference. It's the delta that makes it okay. Because look, if I have a, a difference, say I'm going from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, what's my delta T here? Delta T equals 100. Well, this is the same as 273 to 373, right, Kelvin? Do you see how that difference is still 100? Okay, so if it's a difference like that, you really don't have to convert. But if you're going to have nightmares about it, just convert and don't worry about it because you never go wrong with converting it. One other thing I want to mention for those of you who actually do your homework, um, the specific heat here might be given to you as a molar specific heat in the homework problems. Don't freak out. Instead of joules per gram, it's joules per mole K. What would you do differently in this equation? Instead of putting grams there, you'd put moles. If you watch your units, you won't mess up, okay? Just watch the units. Or if you want to convert those moles to grams, you can do that. I mean, but if they give you the K in a certain way, it's just easier to just use it. Use it as is and convert things around it. Okay, now that we've actually talked until I was blue about that, let's actually solve. How much heat must be added to change the temperature? So we're doing Q equals MCAT. We're looking for Q. Um, what's the mass of our sample? 250 grams. What's the specific heat? This is a number you need to know, just of liquid water. I don't need you to memorize the specific heat of ice or steam water, but I do want you to know this, and it's 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. You need to know this by heart for physics as well. And your delta T, it's always final minus initial, so 60 minus 25. I know there's only one sig fig here, but let's round our final answer to 2. Thirty-seven thousand watts, joules, or 37 kilojoules. And again, I would accept joules. There's no reason there. I wouldn't accept joules. If you're going to make a mistake, leave it in joules. Don't be dividing by 10 or something crazy. Put it by 1,000. Okay, if 2.09 joules are required to change the temperature of 15 grams of mercury by 1 degree, calculate the specific heat. Well, that's easy. Again, another Q equals MCAT problem. We know the heat is 2.09 joules. They want to know about 15 grams of this stuff. We're looking for the specific heat. What's my delta T? One. All right, solve for specific heat, and our units are joules per gram degree Celsius. Give me three ciggies. Not cigarettes, sig figs. Zero point one three nine joules per gram degree Celsius. All right, number six. Calculate the final temperature after 100, well, 100, 1,575 joules of heat are removed from an 85.0 gram sample of ethyl alcohol originally at 23.5 degrees Celsius. The specific heat is two. If you want, you can solve for delta T and then what but I would do, this is what I would do. Since I'm looking for, um, Final, I would set this up like that right away and just plug and solve. So um, heat is removed. What does that mean? Do you see how that could really mess you up if you didn't watch and pay attention? This is huge, guys. What does that mean? It's exothermic, so my Q has to be negative 1575 joules. 
My mass of my sample is 85.0 grams of the ethyl alcohol. My specific heat is, there are no units there, but it is joules per gram degree Celsius. And then my temperature final is what I'm looking for. What's my initial temperature? 23.5 degrees Celsius. All right, and my final temperature was 15.8 degrees C. Okay, next, a 28.4 gram sample of an unknown metal was heated to 110. So we have a little piece of metal heated up really hot and plunged it, in, plunged it threw it into some water. And the water was initially at 24.6. The final temperature of the mixture was 25.34. So does it make sense that the final temperature is the same? Yeah? So what had to lose heat to make this happen? What? The metal lost the heat. What gained the heat? The water. What can you tell me about the heat and the metal's magnet? I mean, heat lost and gained? They're the same. The heat that was lost is the same that the heat that was gained. So are you okay with me writing Q lost is equal to Q gained? Okay. Well, we already know because of endo and exothermicity that the Q lost is going to be a negative, right? And the Q gain is going to be positive. So one of them has to be made negative, one has to be made positive. So this is the same then as saying negative MCAT equals positive MCAT. Q lost is equal to Q gain. What this is basically saying is that um, the heat of the universe is constant, right? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and, you know, it doesn't matter which substance you put on which side mathematically, but let's do it the right way. What lost the heat? The metal. So we're going to put the metal on the left and the water on the right just to, just to kind of be really correct. So do we know the mass of our metal? 28.4 grams. Um, and again, we're looking for the specific heat of the metal, so we're just going to write C. What's my metal's final temperature? So of the mixture, at the end, they both kind of reached an equilibrium. 25.34. And my initial temperature? 110.0 degrees Celsius. So that's the left of my equation is equal to, I'm going to have to move some pictures here, okay, the mass of the water, 100 grams, the delta T of the water, 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius, temperature final of the water, anybody? Same as the final temperature of the metal, right? They reached equilibrium in terms of temperature. And then um, the initial of the water was 24. So it makes sense. The water's temperature went up because it got something hot thrown into it, and the metal's temperature went down. But look at the change of temperature of the metal compared to the change of temperature of the water. What's up with that? Because the water has a much higher specific heat. Good. So, go ahead, and this is a little bit of an algebra nightmare. Oh, this is not, because we're just solving for C. I'm going to talk about a nightmare that will show up in your homework and why I want you to practice it. But someone go ahead and give me that specific heat. Okay, go ahead with the answer. Point, can I get a second on that? I think that's right, if I remember correctly. Joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, one other problem that you're going to see a lot of when it comes to these Q lost and Q gain, they'll set up this exact same scenario, but they'll say something like, what's the final temperature of the mixture? So how would I do that? Well, you're going to have Q equals MCAT equals MCAT, but you're going to have T final minus T initial equals negative MC T final minus T initial. Okay. If you're looking for the final temperature, you plug everything in, but you won't have final temperature on either side of the equation. It's just ugly algebra. But nothing you can't handle. You've got to get like terms together and all of that. Okay, I believe, let me just make sure, 
Yes, because we're starting calorimetry tomorrow. So that is it for the day, my friends.